All right, I think we start. Welcome to this week at Army Talks. This week is a pleasure to have Dr. Jen Jen Chung, who is a senior researcher in the Autonomous Systems Lab here at ETH Zurich. Something about uh, her. So um, in, in 2010, she received a Bachelor of Engineering from the University of Sydney. She then pursued a PhD on information-based exploration exploitation strategies for autonomous soaring platforms at the Australian Center for Field Robotics at the University of Sydney. She then moved uh, to US where she joined Oregon State University as a postdoctoral uh, scholar working on uh, multi-agent learning methods. And, uh, and then she, she, she came to Zurich where, where she currently is interested in uh, including perception and learning um, uh, concepts for mob mobile manipulation and algorithms for robot navigation through crowds. And that's actually going to be the topic of today's talk. So without further ado, Jen Jen, uh, we are very interested and look forward to hearing your talk. Go ahead. Thanks very much. And thanks for the invitation to present uh, at the Autonomy Talks. So I'm pretty excited to talk to you guys today about this topic of safe robot navigation in dense human crowds. But I think for most of you, it would also be kind of an interesting choice of topic, given that apart from a few notable exceptions, the presence of human crowds has all but disappeared in the last 12 months. So why are we, why are we even talking about that today? Well, uh, the reason why we've been working on this topic is because we've actually been part of a, a larger European project called CrowdBot, which is looking at exactly this idea of how do we move robots into human environments? And in particular, we're thinking about crowded human environments. And in this video here, what you can see is uh, Shibuya Crossing. This is an intersection in Japan, which is famous for being one of the most complex, one of the densest uh, intersections in the world. And here you see the video from kind of uh, down on the street level. Most of the people are, are kind of navigating to the other side of the intersection, but of course there's some people here taking photographs. Uh, there's other people looking at their phones. And of course, there's this person who made the video who's filming themselves crossing the street as well. So there's a lot going on in this space. And from a bird's eye view of this intersection, you can see kind of the macro and micro complexities that are going on in this space. So what we would like to do as part of CrowdBot is to be able to come up with navigation strategies where we could guarantee that we could plonk a robot down into the space and have it navigate safely and efficiently through this human crowd. Because we can see that um, humans obviously are very adept at doing this. And there's a lot of different things that are going on, a lot of different complexities that are happening in this space. Um, not to mention that the crowd changes depending on um, how far through they are when they're crossing the street, because when the lights start to flash, you can see that there's people kind of piling up, waiting to cross the street in the other direction, um, whereas the stragglers are kind of getting stuck um, in this space. So there's a lot of different things that are happening in this. And uh, what we noticed when we were starting out this project was that actually there's a big gap in our knowledge in terms of how robots can navigate in spaces where humans at the moment seem to have quite, a, quite an upper hand on this, on the robots. So if we wanted to envisage what a potential solution could look like, we can always turn to Hollywood um, to give us a view of what the future could hold. And here is a clip from the movie iRobot. Um, where we can see one of the robots down there navigating quite adeptly through the crowd. It's running, um, it's not running into anybody. Um, it manages to navigate quite swiftly, even though there's quite a few people in this space and all these people are trying to get to some other goal. And you can see that it's moving at quite a fast pace, uh, so much so that our protagonist, played by Will Smith, um, needs to do some pretty, pretty exciting parkour maneuvers, or at least his stunt double does. Um, has to do some pretty exciting maneuvers to try and catch up with this robot. Now, this film was made in 2004, but it was set in 2035, which is still some time in the future. And if we were to look at what would happen today if uh, our protagonist wanted to chase down a robot in a crowded scene, well, I think it would be far less exciting because it would go something like this, where the robot's trying to move, suddenly there's some people in front of it, and it's, it's basically just stuck there. So this is not even a particularly complex environment. You know, there's some people moving around in the background, but mostly the people standing in front of it are, are reasonably static. And there's a fair amount of free space um, just to the left over here that it, it fails to utilize. Now, it doesn't even have to be nearly this complex. I mean, we could even have 
just two or three kids who want to play and interact with this with a robot to really stop a robot from being able to achieve any of its navigation goals. And especially what I especially like in this video is that it shows that when robots are navigating through environments, there's a lot of there's a lot more going on um, than just knowing where the free space is. There's a lot of complex social interactions at play beyond just having the robot move so that it doesn't run into things. There's a lot of other things, a lot of other human robot interaction that we need to take into account. And so this is exactly what the CrowdBot project um, is trying to tackle all these different elements. And so this is quite a large consortium with uh, seven partners across all of Europe. And what we're trying to do is to see what kinds of sensing and what types of compute we currently have available onboard our mobile robot platforms and how we can use these resources in order to better uh, come up with better navigation strategies in human environments and particularly for crowded environments. So a large part of this is looking at how we can do pedestrian detection and tracking and then from there also how we can do prediction of how uh, people will move, how individuals will move and how the crowd will evolve. And then once we have that information, how we can use that then uh, to come up with navigation strategies for the robot to plan through these crowded environments. And so these are some examples of some tests that we ran back in 2019, where you see the consortium we kind of walk in front of it, see whether or not the robot will freeze, whether it will stop. Um, we try different types of flow behaviors where we're not just walking in the same direction as the robot, but we're also uh, walking perpendicular to where it's trying to navigate. And we see if somebody stops in front of it, that it, the robot doesn't just freeze, but it's able to move around. And in a lot of these scenarios, um, actually you'll see that the participants all members of the consortium, we're kind of running into each other and tripping over ourselves, trying to make the robot stop or trying to make it fail in some way. So in some ways, this is not a particularly natural crowd because we know that we're all trying to get the robot to fail in some way, um, but it's nice because we're really trying to test the limits of what's currently available in this platform. And so like I mentioned, um, the, the consortium that we're working with is quite large. I wanted to show this picture here because uh, this was the last time we met together at ETH Zurich back in 2019. And a lot of the work that I'm going to talk to you about uh, in the next hour is going to have ideas and effort and time that's been contributed by all the people that you see in this photograph. And so in particular, I wanted to point out the local team. So we're from the Autonomous Systems Lab. Um, so we have contributions from Bob and Siebert, of course, our lab director, Juan Nieto, um, who's now at Microsoft Mixed Reality and AI Labs. And of course, Daniel Dugas, who is a PhD student in his final year of his PhD, and he's the main contributor to the work that I'm about to talk to you. Okay, so given we have all these questions in the CrowdBot project, um, from our team, from our local team at ASL, we're focused mostly on the navigation aspects. And so for, for the work that we wanna do, there are four questions that really come into play uh, that we need the robot to be able to answer in order to have efficient navigation. And so these questions are, where is the robot? Where is it in the world? How does it localize? Who's around it? Um, where are the people? What's the crowd doing in terms of flow? Where is it going? How is it able to plan a path in its global map and then track that in the trajectory? And then finally, how should it get there? So not just moving its space um, to track that trajectory, but also what other kinds of, kinds of interactions it might have to um, encounter along the way. And so for this talk, I'm just going to focus on these bottom two aspects here of the path planning and the robot crowd interaction behaviors. But of course, if you're interested, um, I'm also happy to answer questions about any other aspect of the CrowdBot project. So to start talking about robot navigation, um, I think we should go back in history a little bit and look at how this work started in terms of being able to even uh, predict how humans move in crowds. And a lot of the early work was looking at trying to model these behaviors and modeling these interactions in things such as using a social force model. And uh, here, the social force model encompasses aspects of um, goal reaching. So there's a term where uh, all of the agents that you see on the left have are attracted to a goal on the far right. And they also have a repulsion term, so they don't want to run into the other agents. And these two elements are being balanced by some, some kind of weighting. And then from there on, um, we've also had a lot of work in multi-agent navigation, multi-agent collision awareness, which has looked at 
first of all, velocity obstacles. So how do we model dynamic obstacles in the environment based on where we think they are going? And then furthermore, uh, some of the later works that have followed on from that have considered all these other obstacles in environments, not just as passive obstacles, but as other agents who are also going to contribute to the collision avoidance efforts um, of the team. And so in this animation that you see, these are reciprocal velocity obstacle agents. And the planning algorithm that they're using assumes that the other agents that they can observe in this environment are going to contribute in some way to the effort of not running into each other. So they're not going to think that the other obstacles are just going to continue moving in a straight line, but if they observe that there are other agents moving around them, then they will also make evasive maneuvers, for example. Now, these two methods are, are generally quite uh, geometric focus or velocity focus, and they, for the most part, do a pretty good job of modeling some of the behaviors that we observe in human crowds. So you can kind of see some parallels between these animations, as well as what we saw before at the Shibuya Crossing video. But we also noticed that for a lot of the interactions that we see, actually they're not very well modeled um, by these kinds of geometric primitives. And in fact, uh, when we look at the data, actually there's a lot of examples of people breaking the so-called social force rules or, or not being very well modeled um, using these other two methods. And so there's uh, another kind of stream of work which has looked at more data-driven methods of how to do pedestrian tracking, pedestrian prediction of how cars move through these spaces. And so some of the seminal work in this area comes from Troutman and Krausen, also from ETH. And in their 2010 paper, they formalized uh, the freezing robot problem. So this is what we saw before where the robot just can't move, can't find a solution, it just stops in its tracks. And apart from that, um, they also created, a, they also proposed a model for interaction based on coupled output Gaussian processes, which they call interacting Gaussian processes. And they were able to use this to form navigation strategies, um, which they tested using these data sets of uh, overhead cameras of people moving around. Now, this was back in 2010, and of course, the most recent work has used the more popular uh, function approximators these days, which are deep neural networks. And so there's been a lot of work uh, looking at collision avoidance using deep reinforcement learning or CAD RL. And this is work coming out of MIT from 2017, which has looked at um, how to do, how to learn collision avoidance policies um, using deep reinforcement learning and some information about uh, LIDAR information for where static obstacles are as well as where uh, people are in the environment. And so this was extended um, to have socially aware information built in as well. And in this case, the socially aware CADRO work um, also encompassed ideas that were like, you should be traveling on the right, um, you should overtake on the left. And these kinds of ideas they tried to bake into the policy that they learned at the end of the day. Now, each of these kinds of methods require some kind of a deep neural network. Um, and the way that they represented their state in this case was to have the robot state, so these six elements here, but also some number of agents that they observe near the robot. So in this case, they chose the three closest uh, people that they could observe and track, and they tried to take those parameters in as inputs to work out what the value of being in that particular state is, and then from there they could work out uh, what the best action to take would be. And so again, there's been more work on this. Instead of restricting it to just the three closest agents, um, extensions have looked at how we can have the n um, closest agents where n is not, no longer constant. And you can incorporate this via some things like LSTMs. And of course, there's other methods that try to directly encode interaction information in the network itself, try to observe these kind of spatial correlations and the spatial interactions before pooling it and then passing it to a planning component of the network. And some of the latest work uh, has looked at combining these with more information about the environment. So having occupancy grid information, also kind of the same information, but related in an angular representation, and then being able to pull all of this information in to finally come out with some sort of a controller that can move this move our robots uh, through these environments. 
So all of these methods that you see on the screen here, these all assume some knowledge about individual pedestrian states. So they all have to require some kind of uh, pre-processing step that's able to detect where the people are from either the raw camera images or from the raw LiDAR images. But if we look uh, a little bit further uh, back at some of the other kind of end-to-end -end, um, navigation strategies that were coming around roughly the same time, a little bit earlier, you can actually see that you can, there's a possibility of learning navigation policies directly from the raw sensor information. Um, so what you see in the video is actually the, the policy being trained. Um, we use MoveFace as our um, expert teacher, and we train using a supervised strategy um, to figure out just from the raw LiDAR information and knowing where the relative goal position is, um, what kind of control uh, we should be executing at every step in order for the robot to reach its goal. And actually it performs quite well. It performs uh, reasonably in these kinds of environments, which are somewhat staged, but also in these environments here where we have notoriously difficult chair legs and table legs, which uh, are very bad for LIDARs. Uh, if you've ever had any experience, they like to reflect things all over the place. Um, but having given them some experiment, um, some examples during training, you're able to come up with policies that can actually adequately deal with this. And so this example here has not really a lot of people in the environment, so you might be questioning whether or not this works for crowded environments. It works for dynamic environments, um, of course, but um, recently we've also seen some proof of concept where we have a very similar architecture taking the raw LiDAR information, goal information, and the current velocity states, and then being able to pull this in and demonstrating this even in environments with people moving around. Now, the difficulty is that if you want to trade off uh, the information, for example, in the previous slide, where you have all of the pedestrian tracks and you know where the agents are in the environment, to you know, examples here where we just use the raw information. Well, there's always going to be a trade off because that information that you took away, that high level information of where those pedestrians are and what those pedestrian states are, this information needs to be compensated for by the network itself. So this means that the network needs to learn this as some kind of a latent representation from the raw sense information. And this we know can be very data hungry, it can be very expensive, and it can be also very inefficient if it's done naively. So what we want to do is look back at this uh, core problem of crowd navigation. And what we want is to have our sensors, uh, just the raw sensor information, so LiDAR, RGBD, for example, um, giving outputs that look something like this. We want to be able to use this information to directly compute what our command velocity should be for our robot. And so for our Pepper robot, for example, it's velocities in X and Y, as well as uh, angular velocities. And we want to be able to do this, of course, over time. Um, so we want some kind of a control policy. And so for us, we take a reinforcement learning approach in this case. Now, of course, for, for what we want, we need a controller to come out of this. Um, but for the controller to work well, what we can kind of try to leverage is some kind of a prediction mechanism. So some kind of prediction mechanism that says, given that this is my current state, what do I think the next state could look like? Because if we are able to do a prediction step perfectly, for example, then we could definitely optimize a controller to work in these kinds of scenarios and it would work very well. But of course, this is challenging. And given that our sensor information can be very high dimensional, then one of the other steps that we need to take before that is to also compress this information in some way to make it more tractable for these downstream tasks. Now, what's really nice is that there's actually work um, from Europe's 2018 on this idea of world models, which has a very similar structure to what I just described. Of course, they apply it in a very different scenario where they're playing um, computer games and they're using the screen image um, as the current state. So what they do in this world models work is they take the input image, they compress it using a what they call a vision model, and they encode it into a latent space, which is much lower dimensionality. Then with this encoding space, they pass it into a memory network, some kind of a recurrent neural network, which then tries to predict um, what the future state will look like. And at the output of this, they can also take another hidden latent representation from this memory network. And then using both the encoder latent representation 
and the recurrent memory uh, representation, these two become the input to the controller, um, which in this case can actually be much lighter because a lot of the representation capacity is now built into these top two components, the vision model and the memory model. The other advantage of this is that unlike um, our controller, which if we're doing reinforcement learning, for example, needs to be trained online, the V and the M models can actually be trained offline using unsupervised learning methods. Because if we have uh, image streams, for example, we can train an autoencoder. And if we have sequences or video streams, then we can train the memory network. So a lot of the kind of heavy lifting um, can be trained, done with offline training. And then what's typically the expensive part of reinforcement learning, which is training the controller, we can actually reduce the amount of effort that's um, typically applied here by having a much smaller network representation here, and also therefore requiring much less training data and much less training information and time. So this seemed like a very promising strategy for us, but we did have three questions that we wanted to answer um, by going down this path. The first was that, can this framework actually learn crowd navigation policies? So we know from the original paper that they've applied it to a quite a different domain. Um, and we weren't sure how well this would translate to something like crowd navigation. So this is something that we wanted to verify. Second thing was um, given the kind of structure that we have in this world models, we wanted to know what the influence of each of these modules are. So what is the influence of V? What's the influence of M? Um, and how much does it matter uh, for example, how they're trained. And this is our third question. So what's the impact of training these jointly, training these in a modular fashion and so on. So when we go back to the navigation problem, the kinds of environments that we're looking at, we, we start with something quite simple. And in fact, we're only looking at the 2D LiDAR information um, to start off with. Because I think given the kinds of environments that we're thinking about and the kinds of complexity that we're thinking about, this is a good first step just to check whether or not our, our guess of this world models being a good strategy to pursue uh, is a good way to start off. So on the left, you see the kind of training environments that we have. They're very simple, very blocky, um, but they do represent what a lot of the other works in, in the state of the art of crowd navigation are, um, are testing. Um, there's no actual difference between the yellow and the red LiDAR lines. It's just to show you which way the robot is facing in, in the environment. So given this as our environment, um, our state inputs to our learning problem will first of all need to consist of the robot state itself. So this includes uh, its velocities as well as the relative position of the goal. And so these five numbers are pretty straightforward. But on the other hand, we also need some way of encoding the raw sensor information. Um, and this looks like uh, the LiDAR representation that you can see here. And we've chosen to go with a polar representation. So each of these uh, scans are binned according to the angular resolution. And the further away uh, the return comes from, the wider the kind of uh, band you get from the end of the return. And so if we flatten this out into a rectified image, this is what it would look like. Um, and this is what we could use, for example, as an image input into uh, our network. What's really nice about this representation, um, especially is that because we're dealing with crowd navigation, often we have a lot of legs in our data set and legs typically are very hard to pick up, especially from, uh, even from a short distance away, but especially from a long distance away. And because they, form such a small part of the LiDAR return, um, it's often very easy for something like an autoencoder to kind of just wash them out or smooth them out. And we really didn't want that because it's very important for crowd navigation to know where the people are. And so with this rings representation, with this polar representation, first of all, people that are close to the robot um, are always going to be picked up with a higher resolution. And not just that, but they also cast a very long shadow, which makes their uh, footprint, as you could say, in the rings representation that you see here, actually quite distinct. The other option, of course, is to forget about all this complexity and just take the raw 1D information coming from the LiDAR scans and pass that directly as well. And we do compare both of these as state inputs to our problem. So very simply then, we have our ground truth information coming from our LiDAR data, and we want to train up a variational autoencoder in order to be able to uh, reconstruct these images. And so what's really nice is that we can see 
that uh, for a lot of these smaller features like the legs that we don't lose them. And given that we can actually train all of this offline, we can train it to a degree that we are satisfied with the quality of the output. And then from there, we can just use the encoder head to get our, um, to get our latent representation out. For the sequence to sequence predictor, it's also very straightforward. Um, we have our sensor information coming in, which is encoded by the encoder component of V. So we just take our uh, latent representation. We get a sequence of those. Um, they get passed along with our commanded action for the robot to our memory network. And the goal is to output then the following sequence of um, images, following sequence of state representations. And actually, in order to train this, we need to have the encoder as well, because it encodes it into the latent representation that gets passed through. And then the decoder then um, outputs these images in order for us to calculate the loss. And so again, we take the latent representation from the memory network, and then we can pass these both into our full controller architecture. And because a lot of the, like I said before, a lot of the complexity is taken up by the V and the M networks, our controller is actually a very simple two-layer fully connected network. And in there, we pass through, first of all, the robot state. So there's five numbers that we talked about before. From the sensor information, from the LiDAR information, this first gets passed to our autoencoder, where latent representation can get passed directly to the controller, but also is combined with the commanded action into our memory network. And then the latent representation of the memory network also gets passed to our controller. And so these three elements form the input state to the controller that we're training in reinforcement learning. OK, so if you recall the three questions that we had about this learning framework, first of all, does it work? Um, second, what's the importance of each of these modules? And thirdly, what's the impact of the training scheme? And so for the, the, this third question, this last one about training, um, we had a look at three different types of uh, network training schemes. So the first was to look at a modular training uh, strategy, where first of all, we trained the autoencoder um, to the point of convergence, and then we froze the weights. And then after that, using the encoder, um, just as it has been trained, we then train the memory network using the frozen weights of the autoencoder. The second strategy was to look at what would happen if we train these two things jointly. So what happens if we um, train both the V and the N networks simultaneously, um, just on the outputs of uh, the loss function and the M? Um, we could also, for example, warm start the V by training it first and then um, making sure that we don't freeze the weights, but actually free them up to be uh, so that the back propagation goes all the way through um, in order to train both of those weights. Um, and the last thing that we did was uh, to also look at uh, a different kind of encoder architecture for this memory network. So in the original world models, they used an LSTM inside here. But of course, there's been a lot of excitement about transformer networks, and we thought we'd give that a try as well. And so in that case, we replaced the LSTM with a transformer with a similar number of um, network parameters just to see what the differences were there. And of course, we also used uh, the joint training structure for the transformer architecture. Okay, so with those three different uh, training schemes and architectures, we also wanted to answer the second question of how important each one of these elements was. So um, we tried an ablation study in this case, where first of all, we looked at what happens if we just pass in the latent representation from the encoder. And this is, again, also for the modular joint and, um, training architectures as well. So we could train jointly with the memory architect, um, with the memory network, but then during the RL component where we're training the controller, we actually only pass through um, the encoder from the vision network. And the second one we wanted to look at was what happens if we just pass in the latent representation from the memory network. So if you've been keeping track, <laughs> let's have a look at all the different methods that we tried out. So first of all, we had uh, three different training strategies and different architectures. So the modular, the joint, and the transformer uh, joint training. We have three different inputs to our controller, just Z, just H, and both Z and H being passed through. And as a comparison, um, we also created an end-to-end -end reinforcement learning baseline. 
to we've got rid of all of the V and C modules, we just had one controller and we trained that end to end. Remember, we also have the two different state input representations, the 1D, just the raw ladder information, and then the rings representation. And so altogether, we have 18 um, different unsupervised nav rep representation uh, networks that we trained, and then we had two end-to-end -end baselines. And so to train our networks, we actually train them all in this environment that I showed you earlier, this really simple blocky environment. But then when we went to go test them, um, we actually test them in much more complex uh, scenarios. So they, they increase in complexity. So first of all, we have some standard maps. Um, these are actually taken from um, works that I showed you earlier. Um, so this one's from the end-to-end -end navigation paper. Um, we also generated some more of our own, so some that kind of look like offices um, with a higher or lower degree of fidelity. And then finally, we also tested in an environment which we created from uh, real-world basic data. So we drove our Pepper robot through our office environment, collected the data, created a map, and then used that map as one of our testing environments. All right, so before I go ahead, I'm just going to let Daniel summarize this. Can unsupervised learning assist RL for navigation, and if so, how? End-to-end -end RL allows learning control policies from sensor data. With unsupervised learning, the task is split into feature extraction and control modules. In this work, the state is a combination of the goal velocity state and the LiDAR state, for which we try different representations. To learn efficient encodings of this state, we implement three unsupervised learning architectures and an end-to-end -end one for comparison. We explore three latent feature variants for the three unsupervised architectures and two LiDAR representation variants for a total of 18 unsupervised architectures and two end-to-end -end ones. The unsupervised learning architectures are trained and their performance is compared. We show that they are able to reconstruct sensor data, including small moving objects, which are important for navigation. We see that they are able to capture some of the dynamics in the data, as seen in the dream on the right, generated by a model trained in the environment on the left. Using reinforcement learning, we train each controller from scratch up to three times. This is done for the 18 unsupervised learning variants, as well as for the two end-to-end -end ones. We then test each variant in previously unseen environments across different scenarios. This allows us to compare the performance of each architecture and variant, as well as measure their ability to generalize. Finally, we show our approach running on a real robot, where it is able to navigate successfully, avoiding pedestrians and obstacles to reach its goal. Despite this, we see inefficiencies in the planning, which show that further research is necessary if data-driven methods are to compete with traditional navigation planners. To this end, we make all our code, models, and documentation open source to make this work simple to reproduce and we hope others will use it and further the state of RL research in robotics. Yes, so as Daniel said, um, all of this work is open source, um, and if you like, we can share the links afterwards as well. So just a look at kind of the, the main results of this work. So um, these here we actually have 21 different variants. The red one that we haven't mentioned before, this is SOA VRL, which is another one of the state-of-the-art reinforcement learning um, strategies. Um, this one actually has access to individual pedestrian locations, so it has a little bit more information than all these other methods over here, which just use the raw LiDAR information. So this is the aggregate over all three different maps, and this is it split out over individual maps. And what you can see is that, well, as we go to more and more complex maps, so once we get to the real world map over here, all the algorithms drop in their performance, all the policies that we learned um, get worse and worse. And the ones that struggle the most, the ones that are hit hardest, are the end-to-end -end, uh, baselines, which suggests that there's potential overfitting going on. But um, we can see that, of course, if we train in really simple blocking environments, when we get to these really noisy environments where we have strange reflections and, and things uh, that, that possibly are not very well represented in the training data, that all of the policies um, reduce in performance. The other kind of trend that we can observe is that the rings representation, which is in these darker blue, green, yellow results, um, are definitely better as a representation choice compared to the 1D um, information. So definitely there's, there's 
value in using this representation because it does highlight those particular points of information coming in from the sensor data, which is going to be more important for the navigation problem. Another interesting thing that we discovered was that jointly training, um, when we did joint training, which is uh, these examples over here, uh, green and yellow, that if we were to just use H as an input, actually it does a very poor job. However, we don't see that drop when we just use the Z as the input, which suggests that a lot of the information that comes from the predictor is actually being um, backpropagated somehow into the, the encoder components as well. But this is something that we haven't done a full study on, but it is kind of an interesting result to see here, to see this kind of drop in performance, which is quite consistent um, across these experiments. Okay, but then looking at these uh, results, then can we answer that first question of does it work? And can we use world models as a representation for learning crowd navigation? Well, I think the answer is a somewhat unsatisfactory kind of, because if we look at the success rates, we're still struggling to even hit a 50% success rate. So there's quite a lot of cases where the robot just fails to reach its goal or times out in some way. And so, um, even when we compare against kind of these state-of-the-art methods, they, they still struggle in these environments. So it's, I think, fair to say that there's plenty of work that's still to be done in order to get to a point where we can actually use uh, reinforcement learning or learned navigation strategies in real-world complex human crowds. The other thing is that when we actually went to take our robot into the real world and uh, deployed it, deployed our learned algorithms there, uh, this is in the Hauptgebäude, and this was one of the tests that we did last year where there were not that many people around. But in these experiments, what we were seeing is actually in places where it's not all that crowded and there's a lot of space for people to move around, like you see here, a lot of people just opt out of interacting with the robot. <laughs> they, they see it and they're like, oh, you know what, it looks like there's an experiment going on. I'll just take the other way. And for us, while, while we're very grateful that people don't want to interfere with our experiments, unfortunately, the point of these experiments is to see how they interfere with the robot. And so for us, these kinds of experiments and these kinds of more sparse environments where people have choice about where they move to, um, whereas are a little bit unsatisfactory for us. And we would like to see the behavior and the performance of our robot in far more dense scenarios where people may not even be aware that the robot is around or that they are interacting with the robot and we can see a more natural behavior um, to really test out the fidelity of our navigation strategies. And to that end, um, these are the kinds of environments we would prefer to be testing our robots in. Now, this is a video from our Open Lab Day back in December of 2019. And here, what you see is uh, we invite a lot of the general public, friends and family of the lab to come and visit us um, over this night and to check out all of the different kinds of research that are happening there. And during this time, we thought it'd be a good idea to take Pepper out for a spin uh, and see whether or not he could autonomously navigate through a crowd as dense as this, especially a crowd where it's not just full of roboticists or um, ETH students who are kind of tech savvy, but really people who may not be completely aware or knowledgeable about what the capabilities of robots are. And you can see immediately that this is a really challenging navigation problem. Pepper is just trying to get to the other side of the room. Um, but all of its navigation sensors, or most of its navigation sensors, are down at its face. And right now, all it can see are legs. It's really hard to even see a, a bit of the wall, and so localization becomes a real challenge. Beyond that, you have lots of kids. They really love Pepper. It's the same height as them. They're very curious. It looks like a little person. And they have no idea how Pepper is going to interact. So they run up to it, they stick their hands in front of its cameras and its sensors to see whether or not it will respond to some action that they do. And of course, Daniel is our uh, safety pilot, so he won't let Pepper run into any children. Um, but thankfully, in this case, that doesn't happen. Um, all of this navigation is actually happening autonomously. And the only times where Daniel intervenes is when you see, robot raise its, uh, when you see Pepper raise its arms and it's uh, Daniel clicking a button on the controller. And so what we can see is that there are ways that you can get through the crowd, um, even without needing to have a lot of free space around. But having some understanding of how people will respond to the robot can give you a lot of hints about what you can do to perform efficient navigation. And so just again, to show you what the sensor data looks like on the top right, you see the LiDAR data coming in from, from 
this environment, as well as the depth camera information um, also in the inset in the top right. And what's really tricky is that Pepper is kind of a child height. So when people get really close to the robot, it's actually a little bit difficult, even at that point, to be able to identify them correctly and to be able to place them um, in Pepper's uh, frame of reference. So it knows that to run into them or that it knows that there's a person here that it can interact with. But of course, not all human environments are this challenging. And in fact, um, sometimes when we take our robot out, uh, we, we find ourselves in really sparse environments where Pepper can just navigate to wherever it wants to go because there's a lot of free space. And even if there are people in this environment, they're usually quite bulging and they, they have somewhere that they're trying to get to and they're not all that interested in interacting with Pepper or, or messing with it. And on the other hand, there could be scenarios where Pepper is trying to get to a specific location and there might happen to just be one or two people in the way that are blocking kind of the direct route. And so kind of traditional navigation methods might decide to take a really long detour um, to get around this person. But we think like, especially when we look at the way that people interact and people navigate, that many times a person wouldn't just choose to take the longer route, they would just come up and try to get this person's attention to see whether or not they will let, let us pass. And we wondered whether or not this was something that we could get robots to do as well. And so having taken our robot out into all these kinds of different environments, we made two, two main observations. And the first was that as we are going to greater complexity, more real world um, navigation scenarios, we find that there's not really a single motion planning strategy that is going to be the best strategy for all of these different types of scenarios. Now, for all these really dense scenarios, sparse scenarios, places where just a little bit of interaction might work. Um, so far, we don't see one navigation strategy to rule them all. And the second thing that we observed was that um, when people move around in these spaces, like I mentioned earlier, we don't just use our legs to propel our bodies through the crowd. Um, we do a lot more in terms of interacting with the other people in the space. We, we can speak with them, we can use eye contact, body language, gestures, and we use all of these different modalities to our advantage so that we can navigate through the crowd more efficiently. And so from these two observations, what we hypothesized is that in order to be able to solve this problem of navigating among humans, with, that it wasn't going to be possible with a single monolithic controller, and especially not one that only considered the movement of the robot face. And instead, if we wanted to make this problem tractable, we'd need something more hierarchical, where instead of planning over just the low level command velocity actions, we would need high level behaviors that could take into account uh, interactions explicitly as part of the navigation plan. And this brings me to the second piece of work that I want to talk about, um, which is on multimodal navigation behaviors. So we wanted to test out this hypothesis, this idea of having different behaviors and having a hierarchical plan um, to decide between which ones to use and when. Um, and in order to do that, we had to test, uh, we had to come up with different behaviors to test. So the first one that we came up with was uh, just to use a standard RVA planner, a reciprocal velocity obstacle planner. Um, and we call this one in 10. And the idea is that in spaces where all the other agents are relatively goal driven, they're all trying to get to a specific location, um, we can just use a standard navigation algorithm. Um, that would be complementary to that. And RVA is a good choice for this. Now, for scenarios where we needed more interaction, uh, we came up with a behavior that we like to describe as say. And in this case, Pepper will make a verbal utterance. So it'll say something like, excuse me, I'm coming through. And then it'll raise its arms to indicate which direction it's trying to go. And then it will only execute uh, a base motion if it observes that there is now free space. So really it's trying to get someone's attention and then see whether or not they're going to make space for it uh, so that it can pass. And then finally, we came up with a more assertive behavior which we call nudge. And in this case, again, uh, Pepper makes another verbal utterance. Uh, this time it's a little bit more direct. It will again raise its arms, but instead, uh, unlike in say, instead of waiting for free space to free up, um, it will simply start inching its way forward very, very slowly. So we can see the behaviors of uh, the three different behaviors in action here. Turn and tend, again, this is a help avoider. Most people are not that interested in the robot, they're all trying to get to their class and it works very well. 
in C. This is all about getting people to notice the robot. And what's interesting is that even though I know what the robot is doing, it's kind of difficult to ignore when somebody asks to pass you. It's a very human reaction to say, oh, I'm sorry, please go ahead. And here you see the nudge behavior. And Daniel, who is, uh, is the one who coded up this behavior, he's not one to let Pepper tell him what to do. So even in this scenario, Pepper was able to get past him uh, just using the nudge behavior. Okay, so now that we have these three behaviors, um, the question that becomes, under what circumstances should we use each one, and when and for how long? So the way that we solved this was we actually uh, cast this as a sequential decision-making problem, um, and we looked at this as a partially observable Markov decision process. So the question now is, if we have a robot who is trying to get to its goal position at the bottom of this map, there's a lot of different ways it can get there. So first of all, if it thinks that there's a path where there are not that many people and there's a lot of free space, then it can simply just use its intent behavior um, and perhaps take a slightly longer route. On the other hand, if it sees a crowd, then maybe it will decide to try and nudge through that crowd. Um, or if it observes that maybe there's some locations where there's only one person in the way, then they can try to use a say action or say behavior in order to get that person's attention and then get past. So in order to solve this as a PONDP, we need some way of representing the belief state. And we need representation that allows us to distinguish between the outcomes of each of these three behaviors. And so the belief state representation that we designed was, first of all, uh, to look at the crowdedness of the scenario. So where are the people in the space? How dense is it? Then to look at the perceptivity um, of those spaces. So how likely is it that people in those spaces are aware of the robot and are aware of where the robot wants to go? And then finally, um, a state that we call permissivity, which represents the likelihood that given people do know that the robot is trying to get past, how likely they are to let it pass versus, you know, wanting to play with it or, or stand in its way. And so once we have these state representations um, and we can formulate our POMDP, then we can actually use tools like multicolored tree search in order to roll out possible sequences of actions and then to evaluate which ones are going to be the most likely ones that will lead to a robot successfully reaching its goal. And so we tested this out, first of all, again, in the simulation, you'll notice it's the same three maps that we had in the previous work. Um, and then we also tried different crowd scenarios of different complexity. So starting from the simplest one, where it's just an empty map, we expect all of our navigation scenario uh, strategies to definitely work in this, um, this kind of scenario. And then increasing the complexity with a few static agents who are just standing around and maybe some dynamic ones within the space. Um, increasing that um, to more agents, also again, kind of a mixed scenario. And then having a really dense crowd like the one that you see over here in the bottom right. And then we also have two different flow scenarios. One where the agents move perpendicularly, so that we have cross current flow, and ones where the agents move parallel to the robot. And when we tested these out, we had a look at a few different metrics, um, comparing against some of the standard uh, navigation strategies. So this is using timed elastic band. Again, comparing against a state-of-the-art reinforcement learning strategy, and then also looking at what happens if we just use each of the individual behaviors on, on their own. And what we see that is in these kind of more challenging scenarios, three and four, we had denser crowds. Some of these strategies just completely fail. Um, especially in scene four. And the only ones that kind of work are, are nudge, um, which is the assertive behavior, and of course, Ian, which has nudge as one of its behaviors. We do notice that it's not the one that always gets to the goal fastest, but it's always coming in at a very close second because it's always something between just using intent or being able to use nudge. And Ian, our uh, interaction action navigation strategy is able to balance between these two things. We also looked at some metrics um, in terms of social acceptance. So how close does the robot get to people? Um, this TDI looks at how much time the robot spends in intimate space, and TDP looks at how much time the robot spends in personal space. And uh, we can see that in the dense scenarios, we of course have more time spent there. But what's kind of interesting is to see that the timed elastic band actually spends a lot of time close to people when it doesn't have to. So overall, actually, it performs um, not necessarily the worst, but it does spend a lot of time 
potentially unnecessarily close to other agents in the space, whereas um, Ian is able to balance between these two things. Okay, and so finally, we do take out our robot and we deploy our interaction action navigation strategy on the real robot. And you'll see it operating here in our office environment. So apart from me in this video, um, all the other people, even though they're roboticists, they don't actually know what Pepper is capable of or what Pepper is trying to do. So um, many of these interactions where people are kind of blocking its path or, or kind of going about their own way are relatively natural interactions. And of course, we also took it downstairs to uh, CLA during lunchtime to see how it would behave in more kind of natural human environments. And what's nice is that you see this natural escalation of behavior coming out of the EN framework. So first it will use intend, then when it gets blocked, it will try using say. And when say doesn't work, then it will turn to using the nudge behavior in order to achieve its goal. All right. So um, I guess what I spoke to you about uh, in this last hour or so was a couple of the different navigation strategies and work that we've been looking at in terms of how do we get our robots to a state where they can safely, robustly, and efficiently navigate through human crowds. So some of this work, the first part of this work looked at how we can use learning strategies. Um, and one of the main takeaways there is that uh, we can leverage these unsupervised representations that we can learn offline to have more efficient uh, RL learning online and have a much lighter controller architecture. And one of the other outcomes of this is that because we're using the world models framework, these BMM architecture together are actually learning a simulator of uh, the training world. And so what this allows us to do is we can do what's called dreaming and we can actually play inside this dreamed environment. So just given the first frame, um, you can type in your controller um, commands and then you can have VNM output what it thinks the next uh, lasers to return should look like. And so what this potentially unlocks is ways around having really expensive simulators because we can directly learn those in here, which means that we can potentially have access to a lot of training data and a lot of training examples. In terms of the multi-navigation behavior work, well, when we looked at expanding to more complex environments and to much wider range of scenarios where we would like to deploy our robots, we discovered that kind of these single monolithic controllers, while they work well in some scenarios, um, sometimes they often fail when it comes to either more dense scenarios or, or they're not very good at being able to integrate interactions. And so that's why we came up with this interaction action navigation framework in order to be able to take care of that. And what's nice is that um, it's very modular, which means that it allows the inclusion of any behavior modality. So it doesn't have to be these three, you can propose any um, that you like, um, and so long as you can formulate it in terms of its, uh, in terms of the COMDP, then you can solve it using the EN framework. And so a natural question then is to ask where we want to take this next. And so some of the current work that we're looking at is how we can include camera information directly into the Margaret representation. So instead of just using the LiDAR, how can we incorporate uh, the RGBD information that's coming in um, from, from the uh, forehead mounted camera um, also directly into this world models representation and whether or not um, this actually provides us with a useful modality to do crowd navigation. And there's an obvious thing that we can do, which is to combine NAVREP and Ian together to have this unsupervised representation as one of the modalities inside our interaction action navigation. Um, and what it actually opens up is also uh, the possibility of learning some of these Ian behavior parameters online. So what I didn't mention is that um, in order to formulate the COMDP to solve Ian, there's a lot of hand-tuned parameters in there um, in order to, for example, formulate what the observation model should be like. And these we were taking as heuristic functions based on what we'd observed when we took Pepper out and deployed it in the environment. But it will be nice to be able to regress or learn these functions online um, as, as we have our robots navigate through the environment. And finally, um, because Ian is such a flexible framework, uh, there's a lot of different behavior modalities that we would like to try, especially for other robot morphologies. So Pepper, for example, when you look at it, you have a certain impression of what you think it's capable of. 
Um, and it also has certain things that it can do that potentially other robots can't. For example, it can speak, it can raise its arms. So it's a very interesting question is to say, well, if we have something like a delivery robot, what kinds of behavior modalities make sense for that? Um, or if we have a shared autonomy wheelchair um, or even a standing wheelchair, and these are all the kinds of robots that we're considering in the CrowdBot project, what are the kinds of behavior modalities that make sense uh, for robots that look like these? All right, so that brings me to the end. I just wanted to put up uh, details of how you can find out more information. So this is a link to our lab website and also to the CrowdBot webpage if you're interested in finding out more about the project. Um, all the papers are available through both websites um, and also links to open source code and other media that you might be interested in looking at. So with that, I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you, Jinjin. Very, very interesting talk. Are there questions from the audience? Yeah, Jinjin, uh, I do have a question. Just give me one second. Um, it's a very interesting talk, and actually, I um, really got my attention, you know, towards the second part, right? So when you started showing um you know the the robot moving in the um in the main building right so there was a main building at eth um and the question for me is what do you use as your performance metric because just success rate or getting to your destination is really not what you want right uh, I'm saying this because we, we actually did some work, similar work on how to drive a car through a busy street uh, with pedestrians. And what we found is that, you know, really the best way, if the only thing that you care about is getting to the other side of the street, is to just go in full speed, you know, maybe blow the horn, <laughs> and, uh, and all the pedestrians will be scared away, and then you can get to the other side of the street, you know, in minimum time and, you know, with minimal hassle. But that's not what you want, right? So how do you balance you know in your performance metric how do you balance the you know the success rate in navigation or getting to where you want to go with the interactions that you have with the pedestrians yeah so this is a really great question the one that we're looking at in terms of the whole crowdbot project so for for us uh, in our group we're very much more focused on getting the robot to where it wants to go. So for us, we, we focus more on these success metrics um, and are somewhat less interested in the interaction metrics, apart from looking at how close the robot gets to people. So there's this idea of uh, personal space and intimate space, and there's metrics that you can calculate to see how often the robot ends up in those spaces. Um, based on how it's moved into in the environment. So partly it's that. Um, and that's trying to get at what those metrics are really trying to get at is how much disturbance the robot makes to the crowd. So if the robot wasn't there, how efficient could everybody else have moved versus when you do put the robot oh. in the space, how efficiently does everyone else get to this, uh, get to their destination? And so this is work that's a little bit more closely related to what some of our other partners are looking at, because this is far more important for things like the shared autonomy wheelchairs, because in that case, we know, for example, there's somebody on it, they want to get to where they want to go, and they're definitely moving to spaces with other people. But you don't want the shared autonomy to be taking over and you're like blowing its horn and it's causing everybody else to fail to get to their destination. Um, so, so they are running experiments or they, they have been running experiments up until the point where they could no longer actually have crowds anymore. Um, and this was looking at basically what was the impact of the autonomy in the crowd. So with and without the robot, with and without the, the wheelchair user, what's the difference? And so we were looking at have you thought of, um, because, you know, one thing could be to have, you know, that little friendly looking white robot, right? So what if you paint it red, right? And give it like fangs and put yeah. spikes and... Uh, <laughs> really because I think we have this kind of moving target. So we, we always uh -huh. talk about the behaviors of, of how people are reacting when they see Pepper or yeah. any of these other robots. But 
given that this novelty will wear off over time. So the more you see the robot, the less you're interested with interacting with it. Like we're not that interested in ATMs anymore. We know how ATMs work. So right, 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 right. And so there's, there's this aspect of we can, we can take the hard route and say, look, if we just put flashing lights on paper and a loud horn, mm -hmm. we're almost certain to be able to mm -hmm. get to where we want to go. Um, but the goal is not to change the environment so that the robots can navigate. <laughs> the goal is so that uh, the robots get integrated into our environment. So without, with the least amount of disturbance to how people are already interacting and, and working and moving in these spaces, can we introduce robots which have a similar amount of autonomy that reflect perhaps how people are, in, how people are interacting and navigating in these scenarios? Thank you. Great, is there another quick question maybe? We're a bit short on time. Right, doesn't seem so. I think you gave your contact in oh yeah, I see it there in case people want to reach out. Um, thank you very much, Jen, for the great talk. Good luck for your next adventures. Um, and uh, thank you all for participating. See you all next week. Thanks very much. Bye.